Hi, I'm RJ Washington and I'm from Cameron, North Carolina. I'm here at NC State studying art and design, specifically animation and interactive design. And I'm very excited to talk to Charles Harbison about his career. I think it's very important that we have good representation out there and I really wanted to see an example of someone who has been where I've been and managed to go the extra mile to make a great career out of their talents. And I think it's important for everyone to see that as well. Before we get into the interview, um, I wanted to ask with the pandemic and everything, how are you doing? I'm well. Um, Excellent. The last several weeks have been pretty dynamic with some like fun kind of business and professional news and um, gaining some key opportunities. So that's been nice. It's been nice to kind of um, integrate a bit more work into my life. But the great thing about being in LA and um, one of the major reasons I moved out here is to kind of have a better handle on my own mental health and, and kind of setting up a lifestyle that was conducive to um, just more wellness. So I've been, you know, hike, walk every day um, and going to the beach was something I could do up until October, you know? So um, I'm grateful and I'm well, all things considered, and my family's well, I'm grateful for that. And we're getting a handle on this thing slowly but surely, so. So tell us a bit about yourself. What are you doing currently? Um, I'm a fashion designer. Um, I think I should probably categorize the work that I do now as creative direction. Um, I came to this industry through a love of fabric and a love of textiles, which was rooted in my time at State. Um, I didn't even know that initially, kind of walked into university thinking I was gonna be an architect. Um, it's what I'd sold, like, you know, design school on, it's what I'd sold my part scholarship on, it's what I'd sold my parents on. Like, I was gonna be an architect. And then I got in my first semester studio and just fell in love with fabric manipulation and just seeing all these things that I could do with that, I love the tactile nature of it. And for me, architecture cur curriculum, um, I didn't get enough of that. So swiftly kind of changed directions, um, wanted to take on just an art and design degree. Um, the powers that be that I spoke of before, i.e. my family, and my scholarship, they were like, mm, we're gonna need a little bit more from you. And I was like, well, that's, that's art and design is actually more than people understand um, in terms of like how much it can consume you. Um, but I took on a textile degree as well. And it was at the beginning of Annie Albers. So um, being in the first half of that was great. Fell in love with just fiber arts, weaving, tapestry, studying around the world. Um, and then when I, was in my last year, did some independent work in fashion, um, much to like, much because of, you know, Chandra's support, um, was able to do like a small presentation in school, a fashion show, basically menswear of fabrics that I created and um, pieces that I've made. So um, that then took me to Parsons. I used that as my kind of introduction to New York fashion I had been interning for a couple summers um, in New York and then decided to return after I graduated um, state and go to Parsons. That was amazing and wonderful. Um, and that then led me to my first job in fashion at Michael Kors Collection. Um, but then I went from there as a assistant designer. I went on to um, Luca Luca, which is a now defunct women's wear brand that was based out of Italy, that was working in New York. Um, there is where I took on a bit more responsibility, um, embellishment. I was working in fabric more and not just in like, sketching and silhouette, which is what my time at Coors was largely spent doing and special categories. Um, and then from there, went on to Billy Reed where I launched women's wear as a director. And then it was at that point that I started my brand Harbison, I guess about seven years ago. Um, I had an amazing three years in New York of collections, collection-based business, um, shows the whole nine important key press and, and um, clients. But 
at the end of it, I wasn't well and the business wasn't well. Um, and so that's when I pivoted to LA um, with some really good counsel that I had that was just telling me it was possible out here. And I moved to LA about four years ago, roughly, and it's been wonderful. Um, we've just been a direct to client business since being here. We've converted ourselves from a collection to a studio. Um, so we call ourselves Harvest and Studio now, just insofar as I'm now working on branding and social media and advertising and marketing in fashion and consulting across all those things in addition to making clothes so it's a lot of fun awesome it sounds very busy you've done so much i know it's when, when i talk about it it sounds like a lot but you know and you'll find out as you leave school like you kind of you leave i left university with all of these tools and i was just eager to put them in play um, and per particularly for me, being that like my undergraduate work was in North Carolina, you know, I was longing to take that and kind of, you know, dovetail it into like New York society, New York living, New York fashion and figure that out. So I just kind of hit the ground running. Um, and so in many ways, I'm grateful that I had my undergraduate work, not in many ways, in most ways, in the vast majority of ways, I'm so grateful that I was at state because I think it gave me um, when I went to New York, there was like an eagerness and an excitement and just a lot of information, which sometimes when you go to other universities, you don't come away, particularly in design school, with as much info. And State's great about that. Yeah, I have to agree. A lot of professors have been in the industry and they've given me a lot of good advice and are just very honest about what I can expect. So I completely agree with you there. So you mentioned that you first started NC State for architecture, but then pivoted to textiles and fashion interests. How did you first become interested in design? Well, when, when I look back, it really had everything to do with my mother. Um, I think what I was subconsciously and consciously taking on um, and becoming more and more interested in is her process of dressing. Um, I come from blue collar people in like the foothills of North Carolina. So everyone were blue collar workers, but my mom, I would see her transform on the weekends from a meal worker during the week to this just elegant, confident, beautiful version of herself that she loved. And, um, you know, mall trips on the weekend, church, family functions. And I just remember being so proud of her and to be with her. I love being with her and I love what she looked like. And it had more to do with less about what she looked like because I was a child, right? So, you know, subjectively, like I, it's my mom, she always looks good, but I could tell she felt great. And so I aligned dressing with feeling great, I think subconsciously in my mind and just became, you know, over the years, that interest remained. I was applying it really just to myself and how I dressed. Um, but then, you know, when I was young, I was artistic and started, you know, going to painting classes. Mom put me in painting classes. My parents were great about encouraging me in that way. And I think in the end, the two just kind of came together, the sense of illustration and color and light with dressing. To this day, you know, she's still this central muse, even around the work that I do now. Um, Literally, my little brother and I were texting about um, there is a picture of us, like a portrait of the family. And my mom had on this like jazzy blazer. And I remember loving that blazer. And my little brother was like, oh, my God, I do, too. And then we just started going down the list of like dresses and tops and earrings and things of moms that we've loved over the years. Um, so I'm drawing on those references always. Um, and I also talk about that at length as well, um, because I want her to know, particularly as a Black woman, that not only is she central to me personally, but she's central to me artistically. Um, and yeah. Yeah, that's really important, especially nowadays being on Twitter a lot. I think that it can be kind of an echo chamber. And I feel like there's more of a focus on loving and celebrating black women because they have had so much an influence on so many lives throughout time. And they've been a backbone in so many systems and frameworks that we have, and that's previously gone unrewarded. So that's great to hear about. Thank you. So what was your career like 
after leaving the College of Design? Hmm. After I left, well, initially when I left, I went abroad to Central Asia where I was basically studying culture and textiles for the year. And um, I wanted a job in New York. I had been interning at Michael Kors Men's Collection and at Jack Spade for a summer prior to graduating. And so I really wanted a job. Of course, a job did not come through. Um, the interviews in the whole nine. And I was kind of left with, you know, well, what do I do? I'm not sure. So I'm just going to take this opportunity to go kind of further study um, in Central Asia. I did that. And while I was away, my mom sent me some fashion magazines and other stuff just to occupy me while you know living and existing in the third world. But in a, you know, I was in a gorgeous context. I love the people. Um, it was amazing. But um, it was then that I was like, man, I've got to figure this out. Like, I've got to figure out how to get back to New York. So when I came home from Uzbekistan, um, I was just looking at schools and grad school and um, was looking at Parsons. And was just like, this feels like, you know, what the greats who I, um, who I admire, this is where they went. So I think I should go there. And that's really how it happened. And then, you know, after being away for a year, coming back, I went to, to New York um, and uh, got into Parsons and had an amazing run um, studying there. And I think I could tell that I was different because I came from this fine arts and very technical textile background. Um, I, I was bringing different points of view and being a Southern boy, um, bringing different points of view and such to the table. This is, you know, 2007. And um, it kind of um, encouraged me to find some confidence in my particularities. Um, it, it helped me kind of establish that it's okay to be different. And because I was inherently, I was a country boy, et cetera. Um, in this like urban environment, international environment in a way that I hadn't existed in the College of Design back then. It wasn't as international as it is today. Um, and it was good for me. And so I, I definitely appreciated my background and how I was able to infuse that in New York um, life and then into my aesthetic in New York. And I think it just continued to kind of differentiate me. So I really do encourage everyone to honor their background and their work, because although it may um, present itself as being difficult sometimes in process, um, in the end, it is your point of differentiation. And it's kind of a reason for people to look at you and look at you particularly. Right. It's also important to look back at your roots and where you came from. 100%. I mean, it groomed you. And, and those are always going to be your references, consciously or subconsciously. You will always be drawing on those first aesthetics, those first experiences, um, those first colors, those first faces. Um, and the more kind of work you do, you know, I obviously I love therapy and counseling and things like that. So, you know, the more work I do, the more I'm like, oh, wow, like, I do like that shade of red because of X or like, you know what? I love a matching shoe of pump because that's all grandma worn. You know, so it's, <laughs> those things will always be a part of it. Um, I love that shade of green. It's like, you know what? The fields beside, you know, my house growing up had that shade of green. So what were some challenges that you faced and what were some triumphs? I mean, honestly, the ch one of the major challenges was being that boy that I just mentioned, right? Like being different, um, it, you know, the finances of fashion as well. Like fashion has kind of set itself up to be not only a, an industry that um, sells elitism and aspiration, but in many ways it sets it up to where you have to be elite to even be a part of it. So those challenges in the beginning were just, you know, how do I eat and intern for free back then? Because that was the case. Um, and then when I get a job, you know, making sure that how do I dress the part every day while I'm there? Um, and 
But then at the same time, those are points of opportunity. Because I remember one key story, it's funny. Um, I had my interview at Coors and it was like my sixth interview. And it was finally with Michael, it's my last interview. And I needed like another suit. So I had been like, I had like a one suit or two suits that I would kind of mix up with the other directors, you know. Um, but I was like, this is my last interview. It's with Michael, like it's in the big office, like Charles, you've got to do something. So. I was at uh, Beacon's Closet in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg. Um, mind you, like, this is Beacon's Closet 2009, 2010. Like, this is a minute ago, right? So, you know, resale, it wasn't as sexy as it is now. Um, so I definitely got there looking at um, some suits at Vegas Closet and found this wool flannel 1970s Pierre Cardin suit. Like, why the pills, double-breasted? And, uh, you know, I thought to myself, okay, like, I think this is the one. And it fit me enough. And it was literally, I think it was $25. 25 something like that. So got it, took it um, back to mine, put it on. I was like, okay, it's not quite right. Took it to a tailor a really inexpensive tailor. It was kind of like, I think another kind of 50 bucks. So I invested around a hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. On this suit. And it hit me. To, and, and I was like, okay, this looks good. I changed the buttons. I was like, okay, I got this. I went in for the, the interview and um, Lance, who's Michael's husband and also the director of women's wear says to me, that's a really great suit. Is that Tom Ford? And, and foolishly, one, one can say foolishly, you know, I, but I'm a green, honest boy. And I was like, no, it's actually Pierre Cardin. I got it beat his closet. <laughs> <Taylor>. <laughs> um, but it, it was definitely like a really affirming that I was walking into the space with the means that I had. And because I was applying a detailed eye, a sense of taste and, um, and, you know, just, like specificity, right? Was, uh, that I was able to even cut through um, and and kind of present myself in a way that wasn't fully relegated to my means. So then that became just um, a challenge and a triumph, I think, over my career. In the beginning, starting the business, you know, we didn't have, I didn't have, because it was just me, um, they had an office. I was working out of like a, maybe like an eight, foot by eight foot tiny space in my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, you know, we didn't have money for fabric. So I was, I, sometimes I would use upholstery fabric that I get access to really inexpensively. And then that became like a key kind of element of the brand. We were using dead stock fabrics. We were, you know, we were repurposing, we're doing all of these things um, that became points of triumph and signatures that were kind of based off of initially um, a lack of resources or challenges. So, you know, it's nice to kind of think about that because I don't think about that often because it becomes just such a point, a talking point now. Like, you know, I love centering persons of color and queer people in my work, namely black women, um, blah, 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 blah. Those are the identities that I have. But, you know, it's not often that you remember, well, the reason why I've configured that as a signature is because it was a point of differentiation and, um, and, you know, I was targeted because of those identities early in my career. And then, you know, I'm working with sustainability these days. I'm partnership with Banana Republic around sustainability. Um, soon I'll be on a forum with waste management about circularity, but talking about sustainability really was born out of a lack of resources and having to utilize things that are currently in existence and utilize kind of at home, sewers and things of that nature, small businesses. Um, and then I, we found ourselves being quite sustainably um, thoughtful. Um, yeah, Challenger has told us outright that design is expensive. So a lot of us has found ways around it, either helping each other find resources or finding cheaper things that we can use. Yeah, it makes you better. I really, I really can see that it can, right? This isn't to like, um, I don't want to glamorize lack, you know, like um, in any way, shape or form. I don't want to romanticize that process, but at the same time, I want to extol those who figure it out, you know? 
It shows that it's possible too. Um, I'm an advocate for making things more accessible and showing that accessibility works. Just because something is free or cheaper and available to the general public doesn't mean that it's worse necessarily. Completely. So as a black designer, how does culture shape your experience and approach as a designer? And did you tap into this perspective as a student? I am black. And so it's always a part of everything that I do. Whatever comes from me is black. Um, because my blackness is that interwoven in, you know, blackness isn't like a thing that I'm garbed in. Um, blackness is like a culture, it's an experience. Um, I was a black boy as soon as I exited the womb. So um, it's something dear to me and the people who I fell in love with first, the people who were loved me first, people who cared for me first, um, the people who I found beautiful first, they were all black. Um, the experiences that I loved first, the, um, the gatherings that I loved, for, they were all black and with black people. So it's just always there in my work. Um, as a student, I think I was figuring out how to take it and, and create a narrative around it. Um, you know, I love the time that we're, we're living in because um, there's more and more um, encouragement to center Black identity as Black people and non-Black people. Um, and things continue with every year to kind of get better in that sense. But looking at, you know, 15 years ago, it was a different sort of um, situation. And I'm not, you know, trying to say it was so, so bad because then 15 years prior to that, it was a whole different scenario. Um, but I was definitely pushing to figure out how to make it a part of my work um, because up until that point, no one had told me that I could, right? Um, and the nature of college, you know, is that you, you, you know, you're just, you're living in this space of learning. So you're always learning, you're always taking in information. And I was taking in more and more information around my blackness and black thought and all these sorts of things. So it, it just became increasingly important to me to figure out how to make it a part of my work. Um, even though it always is, but how do I configure a narrative around it? and then sell it in some ways. Um, I love that process. And I think because I worked and fought so hard to do that uh, in university and it wasn't always well received. Um, my blackness, my blackness wasn't always well received nor was work that reflected the narrative of my black people, um, but it did kind of introduced me to that idea all those years ago so that now it feels like muscle memory. You know, like I'm, it's never not going to be a part of me and every conversation and everyone who appreciates the work knows that regardless of where they're from, which is a, a lovely thing. Oh, it's really important to me to hear you say that. As you said, in college, you're just figuring this all out and a lot of times people just kind of shy away from their blackness just to fit in or because of bad experiences in the past. In a lot of my classes this semester, we talked about the idea that it's inherently political. The main consensus between me and my classmates was that if you were a black man in America, everything you make is going to be inherently political to someone just because you're a black man and everything you make is going to be indicative of your blackness even if it was never your intention. One of the, I remember once um, a store was, no, my, my salesperson told me that they were kind of engaging a store for the collection. And um, they looked at my lookbook and they said, oh, like it's an ethnic collection. And which is hilarious <laughs> um, because the model was a black girl and she was in florals and like, and you know, Baja's color blocking and, um, you know, the things that I love and in a Zen garden. And from that, because the black aspect of it was so overwhelming to this individual, 
that yes, it was it became inherently political for them. It was a an ethnic collection because they saw black skin. So yeah, it is important if you get in front of it. It's um, it can be quite empowering. It can be uncomfortable, but it is incredibly empowering as well. So, do you get to see much black representation in the fashion industry? It's growing. You know, black representation in fashion is growing and changing, evolving. Um, I'm how best to say this. <laughs> Black visuals are something that are historical, you know, like finding beauty in blackness is something that has always been the case. Um, this is a really kind of a potentially challenging point of view um, that I present. But um, even if you think about the rape of slaves, you know, like one has always found beauty in blackness, even when thinking it to be debased. Um, so I'm not as excited by or heralding of those who present the beauty in blackness, because that doesn't feel new. I feel like we're beyond that. The representation that I want to see more and more is um, Blackness in fashion represented entrepreneurially, um, represented in talent, in decision makers, um, in ownership, um, and in the market, um, things like that. So we're getting there and, and, you know, so many of us are having these conversations in fashion or trying to live out this um, this goal, but yeah, we have, we have a ways to go. Um, fashion being that it is so rooted in ideas of elitism and aspiration and, and luxury, uh, those ideas are inherently anti-black um, because they're, you know, super classist and, and racism bolsters classism. So, you know, it's an interesting thing to be in, uh, because also I want to see and to sell beautiful things. And I want people to um, be wooed by the idea that this thing that I've created helps them represent themselves in the world in a more beautiful way. So in that sense, I want them to aspire to be in Harbison items, um, but I don't want to sell a racist, overly classist dynamic. And so fashion, has a lot to do in terms of grappling with that and how to get at it from the root. Another point, the idea of representation as a trend, um, because we're seeing a lot of it nowadays, this corporate idea of like using representation to get more customers and if that's a good thing. I think for me, at the end of the day, it's still representation, even if it's still rooted in a less benevolent cause, it's still important for people to see black people in positions of authority and entrepreneurship. So it's a double-edged sword, I think, but what do you think about that? Well, I agree with you. It grooms the eye in some ways. Um, there's a story a friend of mine told me. Um, he, his boss, white man, had um, two young boys. And so they were young when Barack Obama was first elected president. And, um, so, you know, his, his sons, along with all of us, you know, saw all of the, the excitement around that and how historical of a moment that was and how it all kind of, it became ingrained in our minds, that family in the White House. And, who you know, I love Michelle. Um, and uh, so then they were watching football one day and all the guys on the field on the team, not all of them, most of them were black. And one of his sons says to him, hey, dad, like, are all those men president? So in his mind, he'd align that like a black man was the leader of the free world and that all of these black men could also be that. And so not only was representation key for black people, it was key for grooming the eye of the younger generation and diversifying um, 
what one could be, right? And, um, and you know, doing the work to release more and more the kind of stratification of gender and race and all this kind of stuff and, and the provincial ways that we can apply it to different roles. So I think representation does that amazingly. Um, it, it was key for me growing up. Jet Magazine and Ebony were key for me. Um, thinking about the Black models that I would look at, you know, and then Black designers, learning about Patrick Kelly and Willie Smith, and um, it, it, uh, it all was key for me. But I think the, the goal now is to make sure that we are also not just depending on the next generation's <laughs> response to said representation to invoke more change, but that we're also pushing um, as hard as we can to take said representation and configure more ownership and then center that ownership so that, you know, you're not always configuring a space where you're um, looking to be represented, but you're also configuring spaces where you're inherently represented. Mm -hmm. You do that through ownership. What message would you give to other Black students hoping to pursue a career in design? Well, my first advice piece across the board is always do what you do and do it exceedingly well, flat out. Do it well, be better than everybody else. Um, that is important to me from just the integrity of craft. And I love craft. Um, I think it's something that we can't forget about in the age of um, media, um, that we remember like people bring home craft, people adopt, they buy craft, um, people pass down craft, um, people covet craft. And um, the media aspect of it can bring them to that point. But then at that point, when you get them, make sure you're delivering something beautiful. And also in my mind, blackness is inherently ingenious and beautiful. So um, encouraging Black students to, in the, in, as they journey through this sometimes burdensome experience of being Black in fashion, that you're also remembering that along the way, you're there because you love fashion. And so make sure that you're beautiful, beautifully kind of um, trained at doing that well. I think that will cut through and also just adds so much additional legitimacy to the already legitimate idea of black um, equity, right? So that should just, that is enough. But then the beauty of saying that and doing that, and then on the back end of it, having this inarguably beautifully well configured thing is amazing. How can we encourage others to learn about and become interested in design? Beautiful design. You know, I think, again, that is what cuts through. Um, as we make things in the world that are um, exciting and enticing and engaging and um, beautiful that more people will ask questions about oh, who did this, whether it be fashion or architecture or animation or ID, um, experience design, um, whatever it is. Um, if you create these amazing experiences for people with the things you create, um, then you will lead them to ask the question about who did this. And then they'll too want to do it or support it. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about this. It's really important for me, especially to talk to an alumnus about their life and their career after graduating, especially since you know, you're know you a black alumnus. So I'm really grateful that you're able to talk to me about it. All right, I'll talk to you later. Hit me if you ever need anything, RJ. Um, definitely, you have a straight line to me, so keep me posted. Cool. I'll definitely stay in touch. Bye. Bye.